We both work with students. Yeah. And it's that, delightful to see um, their approach to their own personal data and yeah. their ability to then compare themselves um, with their peers. And uh, when they but, get looks of shock and horror from their grandparents, but their I baby think, boomer parents, it's, uh, it's well, a curious. I, I, think, I think we have to be very careful the, uh, because you and I see the ones that are more able, that is but true. more mm. more more skilled at uh, life skills and so on. Mm. Uh, I think if we look across the whole spectrum of people, mm. uh, then it may be harder to find people that 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 take uh, uh, this ability to take on board yeah. uh, uh, information or to collect the information. Um, partly because they can't afford it. Yeah. Uh, partly because uh, their culture and context doesn't set that scene. Mm. So I think, um, you know, AMD is going to turn up across the population in every part of Scotland, for every race in Scotland, for every <laughs> gender in Scotland, and it's going to happen everywhere else. And I think it's really important to not develop a model which looks after the people like us who are very fortunate in our context and our, in our ability and in, in our affluence. Uh, I think we've really got to be able to do that for everybody. And, and, uh, and so I think that's one of the reasons why it's really critical to think about, you know, how much can we automate, for example, in recognising things quickly? Because maybe the optometrists don't have as much time and aren't as, as experienced and skilled in a uh, poor part of uh, 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 of a big conurbation mm. than they are than the ones are which yeah. you and I go to. Uh, so I think it, we have to be and 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 it's the optometrists that are going to do the early detection. Mm. You know, there are relatively few uh, uh, of you ophthalmologists. There is uh, 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 you know nine hundred practices of, of optometry in Scotland. There are, uh, I, I can't remember how many, but a rather there large are, number of, of, yeah, of, of optometrists yeah. in, in Scotland, and they're trying to look after everybody, right? And, and um, I think um, optometry is, is a really remarkable frontline part of healthcare uh, in that I believe they probably get more visits even than dentists and GPs do. They're certainly very busy. But yeah. by extension, do you see a, a point in time when it's the patient themselves who keeps and owns and gathers their data, given the fact that well, young people and older people move around an awful lot? And currently, as you will have witnessed, um, the sharing of data, and in particular imaging data, can be a, a challenge between well. one sensor and another. I think I, I think that um, the challenges of getting data shared. Um, I saw this very much in the science program when we were trying to work with uh, uh, people. Mm. Uh, when you one of the wonderful things about astronomy is nobody particularly owns the image of a star, and so apart from. Um, the uh, research careers of uh, the people who collected the image being reasonably well protected. Everything is shared, mm. and nobody is fussing about sharing the images of, of, of everything they're seeing uh, in, in, in space. Mm -hmm. When you start looking at images or other data about people, uh, they get very much more nervous. So I was on the committee concerned with uh, PACs for uh, collecting the images for x-rays and so on in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And uh, When was that? Was, Roughly what year? Well, that was, was, um, uh, was, was with Andrew Morris and, and Dave Robertson um, uh, out at the um, Usher Institute. Yeah. And that was from about... Um, Oh, getting the year right is a, a real challenge. It would be about, uh, I, I know we published a paper in 2017, okay. so it would be about 2016 yeah. to about okay. 2018. Yeah, and, right. and so clearly that was a challenge in terms of access. Well, well, the, well, the, the, the real challenge was that, uh, you know, the uh, people who are looking at the ethical and, and those kinds of issues are very paranoid about some image being shared 
which yes. the public recognises and is shared via the media. Mm. So the fact that most pe patients probably don't mind their image being shared because most people are not famous. But mm. if, you know, a, a top sportsman, motorcyclist, in this particular example they were saying, has their X-ray image of their smashed up leg, uh, and it, and some of them, some journalist manages to get that mm. and put it in the the, the uh, in the Glasgow Herald, shall so we say? Yeah. Then then so they were paranoid about the, the these extreme um, but unusual cases, yeah. right? And it was preventing. Uh, I, I, I think it still is preventing uh, adequate access, uh, which most members of the public would see as perfectly reasonable uh, in order to make research progress better. Yeah. I was the UK e-science envoy, and one of the reasons I had to go uh, to places like uh, China was to talk about sharing um, data. Mm -hmm. And when I was in China, they couldn't understand why we wouldn't share medical data. They said, but if you share medical data, then we may understand the disease 10 years earlier mm. and if you think about how many people worldwide are going to not die or not suffer because we've understood it by sharing it how can it be ethical not to share it yeah. right and 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 you know they we were saying but our ethics committees protect the individual their ethics committees are protecting society mm -hmm. and it's a very very interesting challenge to to argue you know clearly Simplistically, one is not right. And clearly, simplistically, the yeah. other is not right. Yeah. Um, but um, and, and, and the Chinese population still trusts their scientists completely. So the, the, at the moment, they 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 will happily share their data. Um, uh, but uh, we we find that people are rather paranoid and worried about people like yourself and myself who might want to use their data to look at it uh, because I feel it's their data. But actually, mm -hmm. the critical thing is that it's our species data as well. And our species has to be understood because then the, the biology, uh, the biochemistry mm -hmm. and all the uh, results of that, which in the end... Uh, uh, what you are concerned mm. with is dealing with and what any other clinician is concerned with dealing with it, it, it has to be understood only by understanding all of them yeah. because you can't understand the individual because you can't do a study on the individual it's, mm. it's not legal to go and start doing experiments on the individual sure. so you've got to work with the accumulated data and that's a real ethical challenge and at the moment I think we're not biased in the right way uh, I think at the moment we do not believe in the value of sharing for the benefit of the whole. And you have to have a very direct and specific investigation before you're allowed to use PACs. Whereas the kind of issues that we're looking at, like um, which I think the same problem will come up with SCON, what you want to do also is to look if, and see if you can see correlations which lead eventually to your precursors without knowing which correlations you're looking for. And at the moment, under the, under the rules for PACs, uh, that wouldn't be a, a agreed ethically. Yeah. So the, the way of squaring that circle is to um, probably quite rightly uh, allow the individual themselves to have their data, to hold their data and share it with whom they would wish, notwithstanding the fact that they would still need to engage with a, a wider research let, project. But I, I don't want to... Let, let, yeah. let, me, yeah. uh, let me illustrate. One of my PhD students was uh, working uh, with uh, the uh, people who uh, do MRI scans of, of, of brain oh, yeah. images uh, mm. to uh, identify stroke cases mm. and things like that. And um, he he only had uh, one three sets of sample data available. Mm. I and a bunch of my colleagues and my wife all went into the MRI scanner, saying our data is completely available. We're doing it for the purpose of enabling him and other people like him who are trying to do research into how to improve the brain scanning. Uh, and um, we went in 
perfectly and uh, uh, completely explicitly saying we're doing this so that the data yeah. is available for research. Mm -hmm. It was never allowed to be for research because it was done on an NHS machine and nobody in the NHS would give permission for this data that we had donated, which was of our brains, to be used by the researchers uh, mm. that were working with us. Well, that, that shows the, the, the glitches in the system. Did you, did you manage to look at your own images? No. Oh, my goodness. Would you have liked to? Yeah, I, would like, I, I always like looking at my uh, it, images well, exactly, my, uh, exactly my OCT my of, yeah. of the eye. I but really, I look at it with Anna, uh, Anna Maria, and we study it, and we look, we compare it with the previous week and the, uh, yeah, the previous yes. year, and and it's really interesting to see. You know, mm. at the moment we stepped up the rate of uh, injections, and you can see. The, the, the amount of fluid is really yeah, diminished. Yeah. So that, that, that kind of speaks to the point that I was trying to make, that the person who finds it most interesting is the person from whom the images were derived. And so I, I think um, we, we probably don't have enough time <coughs> during a consultation or even today to explore the psychology <laughs> that, that sits behind that. But looking at yeah, a reflection of what is going on inside your own eye or indeed your own brain, if yeah. you could get to see your MR, I think is... An illuminating experience. I, I, I would agree, but I, but I'll, it also, I'm not at all sure how many people Anna Maria could deal with and spend time with each of them discussing their images. I, I'm not sure. I mean, one of one of the problems that uh, the uh, improved uh, imaging uh, uh, has raised for optometrists is that you now have images that uh, you, that uh, the patient now wants you to explain to them. Yeah. But there is no way of funding the t extra time it takes to explain the images uh, in, in most optometry in, in ways practices. that are understandable. I, I quite agree. Yeah. But if you think about the timeline and the trajectory, you go from a bubble chamber to harvesting huge amounts of data on yeah. the phone. It's not doesn't take too much of a stretch of an imagination to get to a point where technology will enable well, information to be imparted in well, the, the context of the patient's the, own the, health. The, the AI for doing things like pointing your own phone at your eye and getting really good uh, diagnostics, including a, spe uh, uh, a, spe a specification of the refractive correction mm. and for your lenses and so on, it, it, it is there, right? And, and whether it works for everybody is, is debatable because I suspect it's been trained on, mainly on North American uh, whites. But uh, uh, what I what I think is important is that the, the this is getting to the point where a huge amount can be done, mm. right, uh, by around, around the world, far more people have these than have landlines, mm. right? The, these are, in mo many poor parts of the world, they are the dominant means of doing everything. Yeah. Uh, and and so, well, whatever the quality of the uh, cameras, you can still do a lot uh, just with... Uh, <coughs> the personal devices people have but the challenge of getting from that into something which um, uh, is deployed and practical and, and is properly uh, dealt with all the strange and rare cases yeah because that that is the problem you know if you if you just train the AI systems on the things that you've got happen to have data for, mm -hmm. then the, the the rare events don't show up. Oh, sure. But that, that brings us quite nicely. And, um, I don't want to keep you talking too long because we're going to <laughs> have for a drink after this. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but the, um, that brings us quite nicely to the project which has brought us together more recently, and that is to curate, classify and catalogue in a secure environment, in a trusted research environment, um, images that are taken in the high street by optometry practices for exactly the purposes and, and many more that we've had time to discuss today. So the um, 
the breadth of that in terms of coverage at population level to cover ethnicity, socioeconomic um, groupings, um, different geographic locations throughout Scotland is is uh, what we're going to be working on. I mean, from the personal and the scientific perspective, um, clearly there are going to be um, challenges and, uh, and there's an awful lot more work to do, um, principally around data governance and ensuring patient confidentiality. But if you were to fast forward, I mean, again, given our bubble chamber to mobile phone, if right. you were to project forwards um, to the value that this project and this enterprise can bring, um, what are you most well, looking forward to? Well, I think there are two things. One is did, there are precursors that are significant and will save people's eyesight that we don't know about today because the high quality images have only just begun in mm. the uh, uh, in, it, to be widespread in places like Scotland, which is very fortunate because the uh, NHS Scotland has, to some extent, uh, provided it. And in um, better areas, uh, there are also OC, OCT cameras uh, in most optometrists. So there is now good imaging, uh, and that good imaging uh, can get uh, very early records and so if we can keep those records together uh, correlated with the individuals uh, not correlated with the practice because for example I've changed practice I go to uh, a place in North Berwick now um, the, uh, the critical thing becomes that you have a source of, of early uh, of, of potential uh, detection of, of early of cause early indicators of risk or indicators of, of an actual uh, disease um, which I think would do two things one is mean that the optometrists could then be on uh, uh, alerted to look out for these things and a second thing is much earlier referral to people like yourself mm -hmm. uh, to deal with uh, more sophisticated handling of those things so that, I think that is one I think the pre early precursor is most likely to have a large effect globally once we've understood them and, and, and I think it's a critical resource uh, to uh, get that resource because previously almost all the research has been done in the hospitals and the, almost all the hospitals are, are collecting images of eyes that have already got much older and have already developed a particular uh, symptom. They, they may uh, still have other things that could be mined, but I don't even think uh, people are studying that. But, of course, it is important to correlate the outcomes in later life uh, with the earlier images in order to discover those correlations. So it's really important that those two setups work together. The, 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 the second thing that I would hope to see is I would hope to see refinement of uh, the classification of conditions in the eye um, because by having uh, a, <coughs> a, a more precise identification of the state of the eye you've got much better ways of understanding whether something is critically important now or what what procedure to apply or what medicine to give uh, than if you've got a, a rather blunt classification of uh, you someone's got this or someone's got that right uh, i suspect that for example glaucoma i suspect is probably quite a lot of different things if yeah. we could only refine the uh the information well enough uh i i, I think it might be quite possible that what this particular wet AMD and some other kinds of wet AMD are different. Mm. It's certainly, I think that uh, the dry AMDs, again, it would be really interesting if one could ident identify and refine our understanding of the diseases by uh, working on uh, recognising significant variations. Yeah, just like bird watching in a way, in, 
yeah. in terms of refining the phenotype and, and what we're seeing might just represent the end stage of many different processes. But um, uh, it's been really delightful. I could talk to you for ages, um, Malcolm, and probably would, given half a chance. Um, I just want <laughs> we to... Can, we can always go oh, uh, do some talking later, oh, you know. We can, we can. <laughs> but you are driving, Mario. Yeah, I am. Uh, yes, I was I'm very driving. disappointed here. But yeah. um, I just want to end up by saying, I mean, clearly you've had uh, a very long and distinguished career, career and and uh, very much enjoying retirement. And I apologise in advance Ooh, for dragging I don't, you uh, in. I don't, I don't, oh, oh, oh I, no, 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 no. I consider reti- the notion of being retired is, yeah. is, is, is a bad word. I don't want to be retired. I mean, you know, uh, well, I had a, a PhD student graduate last, uh, not last Thursday, but Thursday before. Yeah. I've, I, I've got one of my students graduating next March. Uh, I, I hope to find ways of carrying on working. Uh, the university would like to uh, uh, say that it gives us the same facilities as the people that are working there. But in fact, it drives almost all its permissions and mechanisms off the payroll. And when you're emeritus, mm. it doesn't work as well. So I have to work with people like you and Miguel and, 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 and Robin mm. in order to find ways of working. But I don't want to stop working. I don't want to do any less research to next year than I did last year. That's fantastic because you clearly love it. And, I um, do. Uh, I know you've got lots uh, of hobbies, walking, um, yeah. boats are an interest. But, but I just want to end by asking you what makes you happy other than working? Is well, it thinking about working? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. One of the things I like is to have a problem mm-hmm. which I'm thinking about such that sometimes I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and my brain has made a huge amount of progress on it. Mm-hmm. And it might be, how do I explain this in this bit of a paper? How do I get that this student to do that? Uh, and what's the answer to this glossary clue? It, I like having things that are keeping my brain challenged and okay. busy, yeah. and and I really enjoy that. And and I think that that uh, you know, I I think it's obviously critical, and I really don't want that to end. And I don't think it will, but but it, but you know, it will eventually. Well, well it just goes to show. But but, but yeah. you know, that, that I also like being outdoors. I also like doing physical things. So, um, I I, I think. Yeah, the, the, I guess that uh, I would like to do things mm-hmm. like those p- problems and practical things that were also useful. Yeah, right. Now, whether they're useful to uh, 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 birds on an island or fish swimming down a river, uh, <laughs> the river Tyne, uh, where. It is some of the things that I might get into if I'm not kept busy enough with the SCON project, but I would rather be kept busy with the SCON mm-hmm. project. So, you know, I would love to have some critical challenges. I don't want to be paid for it. The notion of um, the notion of not being retired that I care about is having to be challenged and to have opportunities to contribute and to see that that is is working of course it might not be working because i might not be good enough uh um but uh, i'm not looking uh for remuneration mm-hmm. uh and i would like to do these kinds of things as as a volunteer which was explicitly recognized you know my wife works as a cab volunteer and people like that are officially recognized I would like to be doing voluntary research. And if I was doing that in the US, my university would be talking about that as part of its contribution to society, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And, and they would t- they use that they were about as professors like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, at the moment, uh, this university doesn't even consider that. Maybe, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, the College of Surgeons uh, could have a campaign uh, to make certain that uh, the people that go on, like I'm sure people like you will, I'm sure lots of others have done, mm-hmm. to carry on contributing their thinking and their research and their uh, work on doing things like editing journals and so on, 
uh, when they go on like that, I think it should be recognised as a, 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 and valued mm-hmm. as a volunteer contributing. Yeah, wise words, and I think the systems do need to change. And um, I'm really, really pleased that um, you're enjoying not being retired. So That's right. That, yeah, yeah. That, that, that <laughs> is probably uh, going to continue because clearly you have a passion, and I'm also mm-hmm. pleased that you were removed from the bubble chamber. Uh, lab and you uh, managed to break your way out up north I want um, to do it I want to do it for everything I can right <laughs> um, I, I certainly uh, enjoy uh, uh, and when, when I came to Scotland it was in 1978 mm. and um, uh, I uh, started work in the university in, uh, on the 1st of July 1978 uh, and as a lecturer in Computing Department of Computing Science at mm-hmm. KB, mm-hmm. and I said to my uh, family, we bu- just bought a house on the top of Blackford Hill. I said to my family, "Oh, we'll be here about three years, <laughs> and then and then I suspect we'll we'll go to Imperial because Imperial was about the best place for computer science in those days, mm-hmm. and um, or maybe we'll go to the USA." And I'm glad to say, I'm still in Scotland because yes. once you get to Scotland. You can't escape. I've tried to escape several times. I've worked in, I've worked in California. I've worked in Paris. Uh, I've worked in in, in Philadelphia. Uh, but no I'm always back. No I'm always, I'm always the, the elastic that pulls you back very quickly. So I've never achieved escape velocity. Well, spoken like a true Cornishman, uh, might I say. <laughs> but, but thank you very much, Malcolm. That was uh, right. really great. And it was lovely to hear your thoughts and personal and professional stories. Thanks very much. Thanks. I hope I didn't ramble too much. Not at all. <laughs>